Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Cosmin. I'm a solution architect at uh, Big Step, and I, I'll be your, your moderator for Big Data Architecture Track today. Um, it's Simon Ellison Ball. It's director uh, of product management and cybersecurity at Hortonworks. Um, he will be talking to us about Apache Metron, streaming millions of cybersecurity events per second with advanced analytics. So, a few words about uh, Simon. He's a data scientist, has uh, experience in product management, and uh, has worked for numerous data technology companies from uh, vendors like Hortonworks to various data users in retail, hedge funds, and the web. His focus is on big data, machine learning, and using this technology to foster results. So, welcome, Simon. Doesn't that sound like a LinkedIn profile? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Um, we've already kind of introduced me, but the uh, thing I wanted to introduce you to uh, about this slide is this incredibly cute little elephant. Uh, this is a little origami elephant that lives in the Horton Works London office. Uh, the reason it's there is to make a point about how you build big data architectures. Anyone can take a square of colored paper. Not everyone has the experience or the design or the folds mapped out, for example, to turn that into a beautiful elephant. The same kind of thing tends to happen with big data. So you know, what we really need is a pattern, a design, and probably the instruction book for how to solve a lot of the problems that uh, you know, we have. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, that's my Twitter ID. Please feel free to send questions uh, or you know, whatever you want to do. Tweet about if I say anything interesting, please tweet it. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. The other thing I just wanted to ask quickly is how many people in the room are, would consider themselves security people? Cool. So everybody else is more on the big data side, right? <coughs> Good. Um, yeah, everybody knows what Hadoop is. <laughs> oh, it's, things have improved in the last few years. <coughs> so first I'm going to talk to you about why security matters and why we need to start taking a new approach. And uh, I just wanted to introduce you to this thing. This is a, a little IPTV camera uh, that sits on the wall of my house. It's there to... Uh, let me watch and figure out what my cat is up to uh, and where all the fish have gone. To one of the bad guys, this is actually not just an IPTV camera for yeah, watching one's pets. This is a computing device with a high bandwidth connection which is capable of streaming high def video over the internet. That's quite a lot of capability and quite a lot of bandwidth and quite a lot of CPU in a device which was made by hardware people who did not necessarily think of security as their top priority. Which is one of the reasons why devices such as this and their accompanying uh, control boxes ended up being part of the Mirai botnet a little while ago. To give you an idea of what the Mirai botnet did, uh, at the peak of its traffic, no one actually quite knows how much traffic it generated. Reports wide, uh, you know, vary widely because no one could actually measure it. They just didn't have a kit in place to figure out how bad this thing was. But there are reports of around about 1.2 terabits a second of traffic coming from this botnet uh, and hitting uh, from, uh, yeah, about half a million devices were part of it at uh, one point. And that hit the Dyn DNS service, which uh, briefly took down sites like, um, you know, niche sites like Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Google, those kind of things, uh, on the East Coast of the United States of America. So briefly, productivity in New York went through the roof uh, because Facebook was down. Uh, but then a bunch of security people got, had a really, really bad day. So. The real problem, I mean, this is just one of the many examples that we have of a way in which security people are just starting to drown in the sheer volume of data. Because, you know, the kind of attacks that they're facing are actually really, really cheap for attackers to pull off. You know, that botnet I just mentioned, it's for hire. You know, you can hire a botnet for a lot less than it costs uh, to hire an AWS instance. You know, you can get a DDoS like that for about five bucks an hour. Uh, I really wish we could run Hadoop clusters on botnets because then you know, we'd, we'd be absolutely killing the AWS business model. It's so much cheaper when you don't have to pay for the power or compute. 
But yeah, so um, the people trying to fight these kind of things are massively outgunned, massively yeah, outnumbered, and the economics is all completely against them. They're also absolutely drowning in data. So for big data people like us, this is kind of a familiar scenario. We've seen this problem of you know, lots of different silos of data, data coming in from dozens of different little tools, you know, needing to integrate this one with this one, and it not quite lining up, and they're just being, frankly, far too much data to try and figure. So, sorry, we, we started to look at uh, you know, a big data architecture to solve this. The other important thing about this is the speed at which these things happen. Uh, one of the most recent uh, problems that people have started to see with things like botnets is a concept called fast flux. With fast flux, what happens is you get attacked really, really hard for a bit. It's like if you see that extreme workout trend where you do sudden bouts of extreme high energy and then rest for a while. It's kind of like that, but in botnet terms. So you get a fast, fast attack, and you get nothing. And so you, you don't quite know what's hit you. And then you think everything's OK. And then you get hit again. So it's very difficult to track these kind of things around the place because they come and go so fast, but fast enough to cause damage, but also fast enough to avoid the kind of rules that you will have set up on things like firewalls and traditional protection devices. So we need to look at things which can keep up, at least to an extent, things that can keep up with at least samples of these attacks so that we can start to find these attacks much faster and stop them before they, A, either disappear, or B, before they uh, yeah, cause real damage. If you can catch an attacker when they first enter your network, as opposed to six months later when they've stolen uh, several billion of your customer records, uh, for example, uh, not wishing to name any of the particular three or four organizations I could pick on in the last two weeks who've had to admit to such things. Um, so real time becomes extremely important, and that's where a lot of the big data tech that we're all I hope reasonably familiar with comes in. Uh, the other reason that real time becomes very important is particularly in a world with cloud, uh, for example. When you uh, look at a traditional analyst's approach to looking at a threat, what they'll generally do is they'll get a notice off a firewall or something, and then they'll go, and go all right, okay, that IP address, what is that, who is that, yeah, where is that meant to be, look it up in some asset database system somewhere else, et cetera. What we find, particularly with heavily elastic architectures, is that by the time they get around to doing that, looking up on that investigation, the world has moved on. You know, that IP address that generated that alert or was subject to that attack may not be the same thing anymore. Yeah, it might have been allocated to an entirely different type of cloud in instance. It may not even be a part of your company anymore. It might be a completely different company's IP address now when you start to go and investigate it. So if you actually do all the enrichment at the point of ingest and in real time, then you actually get the real context of what the world looks like at the point at which you generate an alert, rather than what it looks like an hour later when an analyst finally gets to the bottom of their queue of thousands of messages that have come at them. So the architecture that we use for this is very, very heavily dependent on real, real time and getting you know, extremely low latency uh, into that processing, both for that time to response, but also for the accuracy of uh, the enrichment data that we collect. And uh, yeah, if we can get that enrichment data to be more accurate, get it to be more complete, then frankly, we just get more efficient analysts. A lot of the analysts at the moment, uh, I was talking to an analyst the other day who was looking at an email attack that had just happened to their company. He went to seven different consoles and seven different tools, from endpoint protection to email protection to firewall to proxy logs, et cetera to try and figure out whether this thing was even real. That's before they even started trying to figure out where it came from and how to stop it. That integration of enriched data at the right time or right point in time makes those people significantly faster. So just giving them that kind of single view perspective. And uh, has anyone ever heard anyone talk about single view of a customer at a data conference at all? We're talking about the same thing. We're taking those same concepts that we've been doing for years in the world of big data and applying them to the cybersecurity use case. The other really valuable tool that we have, which is opened up to security departments by uh, a lot of the big data platforms, is raw network level traffic. Now, this is possibly the most valuable stuff you can get as a security person. If you're really, really lucky, you might be able to keep hold of it in a traditional system uh, for maybe a day or two. 
But this is the record of everything that goes on in your network. Now, if you discover, uh, say, that someone has compromised your database uh, six months after the fact, then the first thing you have to do is notify regulators, et cetera, if you're a big public body, for example, a big regulated organization. And you have to notify them of everything that may have been compromised. So you've got a log, which basically, you've got a log message which says someone who shouldn't have been on this database was on this database. At that point, you have to assume that the entire database is gone. They've got everything. Now, if you can long-term record the network traffic going out of that database or the network traffic going out of your network endpoint, then you can say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. So what? That database has been compromised. Okay, what actually left the building? And you can provably demonstrate that maybe they only got a few thousand records. Now, losing a few thousand records is... Uh, yeah, it, it's a $100,000 fine, and a, we're really sorry, have a, to, have a voucher email to a small number of customers. Saying that you may have lost 3 billion records, uh, or, um, you know, what did Equifax fess up to the other day? 700,000 UK records alone, let alone the Americans. That is a whole other ballgame. And uh, yeah, if you go on to things like the uh, Equifax website right now and put in a random name and random social security number, they will tell you, yeah, you've probably been compromised because they just frankly don't know whether you have been or not. Whereas collecting, having a platform that can scale to collect full speed network traffic gives you the ability to dig back and do that forensics properly and find out what actually went on. You also get a load of really cool behavior stuff out of it uh, as part of real time stream as well. So, another challenge that people are facing in this world is the um, profusion of tools that they have. So I was at, um, yeah, RSA is the big conference in security every year. And they, they hold it in the Moscone Center in San Francisco. And if you've ever been there, you know what an enormous place this is. This year, there were, by weird coincidence, 666 different vendors on the floor. Many of whom were basically pitching the same thing. They were all pitching endpoint tools and a fancy dashboard. So it's yet another tool to bring together. And yeah, the way that you deployed it was you wholeheartedly adopted their thing. You bought up a cluster. You installed 50,000 endpoints on all of your collection devices. And actually, by this point, most people have walked off from the stands. What we really need in this world is much more collaboration and a single data platform that can have open data standards running on it so that these tools can all work against a common set of known data. Uh, but it also needs to be extremely flexible uh, because you know, someone is going to come up with something really cool. All these startups, you know, these uh, you know, startups, mid-sized companies, all these people, these 666 lot, uh, lots of them come from someone who's had a cool idea and then had to build out a huge bunch of plumbing underneath to serve that cool idea. It's someone's PhD thesis which detected a cool thing. If you can start to bring those kind of things and put them on a common shared data model much faster and provide that, have that data model have the flexibility for them to grow into whatever their needs for their particular algorithm are, then you massively accelerate their time to value. You also massively accelerate your own data scientist's work as well. One of the reasons we got into this, uh, this game was that uh, you know, I, I come from a field background. I, I did a lot of field work, architecture work. I went to a lot of customers. I've been in a lot of banks and stood in front of a lot of whiteboards drawing pretty much exactly the same architecture. I would take the bits and I'd say, right, OK, so you need some Kafka here and you need some Storm here and then you need some HDF. All right, fine, use Spark. And then you use some HDFS under here and you probably need some search. Anyway. And, and they dutifully set around yeah, an 18-month, two-year project to start putting all those things together and building it themselves and deciding how to structure all these things. And then they failed. Because the expensive data scientists that they'd, handled, that they'd hired to do this incredibly dull data engineering and DevOps work just weren't in it for that. Neither were, by the way, the people who were sponsoring the project. What they wanted to do was apply security data science. What they ended up doing was applying data plumbing or low-level data plumbing. So having that standard model or that standard open data model uh, is absolutely crucial to getting those data scientists to be able to get to the interesting parts, get to the bits that actually matter and differentiate their business and their service against you know, 
whoever else is out there in the market, that is yeah, the more interesting uh, target, and that's what the goal of our architecture is. So to introduce you a little to the framework and the architecture, uh, this is the architecture for, or the architecture, I should say, really, for Apache Metron. Uh, Apache Metron is an open source project. It's in the Apache Foundation. It's a top level project. Uh, it's been around and it's been through a few iterations, and yeah, we're, we're pretty happy with where the architecture has landed now. Uh, but it originated out of a collaboration between Hortonworks and Cisco called OpenSOC. It has moved on to add various pieces uh, from there. But essentially, what it provides is this strong focus on real-time streaming through a telemetry layer which handles a, um, a very open approach to parsing. We go for a very kind of schema and read sort of philosophy to parsing to extract the information that's relevant from a log line, for example, and allow it to carry on its way as fast as possible. We then have a lot of focus on the real-time enrichment piece there, both streaming and batch. Before we go into possibly the most interesting area of this is the profiler, which I'll come on to shortly in some detail. That provides the behavioral analytics in real time. So we're using a lot of approximation algorithms to do real-time analytics on that data rather than waiting for it to happen in batch later. We then write it out into, frankly, whatever data store produces the best results for whatever your use case is. But we tend to start off with HDFS because, well, we do Hadoop. Um, the other things I wanted to highlight on this are the two ingest paths that we have. We use a, uh, another Apache project uh, called Apache NiFi to handle a lot of the ingest. The reason we use this is that it's extremely good at going out and getting data from random sources. It's also very good at transporting data from site to site and handling things like compression, encryption, et cetera, et cetera. And it allows us to put a little bit of intelligence at the edge so that we can start to trim down some of those huge volumes of data that you get from logs, for example. Uh, you remember I mentioned the idea of raw network taps. Turns out if you uh, have a branch office and you want to collect a raw network tap of everything going over its internet connection and then send everything going over its internet connection over its internet connection, things get quite expensive or physics kicks in. So NiFi gives us a lot of capability to do some filtering and processing and prioritization at the edge. We then also, another key part of a project is this uh, way of handling that kind of sheer volume of raw network data. And uh, for this, we use a, uh, essentially a very, very fast path through the architecture. We've kind of cut a swathe through all this stuff and built in a, uh, a, C, a native C collection agent, which essentially just rips packets straight out of the buffer of a network card. It doesn't even bother asking the operating system about this and shoves them straight onto a Kafka queue for analytics. Uh, we've then modified some of the storm pieces, for example, to uh, we actually have a spout only topology. So we have a single unit which then you know, removes as much latency as possible from that so that we can collect raw network traffic at very, very high rates. Uh, and um, yeah, to give you an idea of some of the rates we've got on this, um, yeah, we had a little six node POC cluster which took data from raw network uh, onto HDFS at a rate of about 0.8 petabytes a day. And uh, that was a starting size. So these things get pretty big pretty fast. Um, the other thing uh, yeah, on, on the other end of this, once we've written it all out to things like HDFS or Elasticsearch or Solar or uh, Druid or whatever you want, uh, you can then provide, you, we can then provide a lot of these kind of modeling capabilities and a lot of these deep analytic forensic capabilities as well. The first part of this really is the enrichment section. Um, The thing about security data is everything is security data to the right security team. So one of the problems with existing security platforms is that they tend to be very opinionated about the type of data they can process. So if you look at, um, if you look at some of the other projects which are in this area, uh, then you'll find that they are rigidly geared towards doing things like NetFlow data, DNS data, proxy data, which are all really good sources and very, very valuable. And we'll absolutely take those. But we also want to be able to bring in things like the authentication data, which is, yeah, that's kind of security focused. 
but also the application data, the HR data, the business data, the operational data, the IoT data from something like a uh, SCADA system, for example, an industrial control system, the sensor data from that can be indicative of an operational problem, but it can equally be indicative of a cybersecurity problem. So we need to be able to bring in all those data types together, hence the flexibility of the schema. And the schema flexibility primarily comes from the fact that, frankly, we just cheat and use JSON. So you can pretty much do whatever you like with it in the pipeline. Um, the, other pe the other source, of course, is that we extensively use um, traditional security threat sources, but also things like asset database sources, human resources databases, uh, to be able to do things like risk profiling of users. So one of our customers, for example, took a lot of their HR records and built up a risk profile of every employee that they had based on things like length of service, uh, access levels, permission levels, et cetera. Um, they then feed that into every incoming alert to correlate that against every alert that they find so that they can determine how important that alert is. And if you've got someone who's a trusted employee who's been there forever, never done anything wrong, then yeah, that's not something you want to put at the top of a security analyst's screen. If you've got the guy who's just spent a lot of time looking around on LinkedIn, has uh, filed a couple of complaints and is a bit miserable, he's going to pop towards the top. So those kind of data sources are absolutely key to what we add in here. There's another piece of context that's very important to this as well, which is the time context. Everything in Metron works uh, primarily on Storm. So you know, for those of you who know Storm, that means we're processing message at a time. The reason we're doing that is that we want to reduce the latency. What that loses us is the ability to really get a handle on what's going on over time. So that's where our profiler comes in. So what we have here is a representation of a bunch of, bunch of streams. So the profiler has access to all the data that comes through the system. What it then does is it takes each of those windows and builds up an approximate data sketch of what's in that stream across the, across the multiple streams. And those data sketches can be built in a variety of ways. Uh, you can actually also write your own. Uh, but the ones that we have built into it are things like hyper log logs. So that gives us the ability to do things like cardinality. We can ask questions like, uh, how many individual servers has this PC connected to over this time period? Uh, Bloom filters and T-digests, all these kind of useful things, doing things like baselining. We also have things like uh, locality-sensitive hashing built in there to run uh, on the real-time stream. So you can do things like automatic real-time clustering, and so unsupervised clustering of messages as they come through. So you've got some quite advanced capabilities in the data science piece uh, there. So that just produces you a bunch of windowed analytics, right, which is not hugely interesting. What we then do is um, pull out a statistic against, say, each of, these, uh, you know, each of these little blobs up here can be compared against, uh, can generate the statistic for their current profile window or their current value, for example. We then need to combine, uh, compare that against some sort of baseline. This is where the profiler gets genuinely useful, because that baseline can come from arbitrary chunks of the previous sketches, because all these algorithms are fundamentally combinable. So we get the ability to pull together uh, each of these sketches, then aggregate and combine them, which means that I can actually look at, in real time, I can ask questions like, is the behavior of this PC or this workstation or whatever, the number of servers it's connected to, for example, in the last 15 minutes, how does that compare to the number of servers it typically connects to in this 15 minutes of the day, going back two years, skipping public holidays, for example? That's not something you can do with an ordinary windowed analytic on a streaming platform. Uh, and that's because of the way that what we're actually doing is storing these uh, very lightweight sketches out into an HBase cluster, which means we can pull them back by key requests uh, very efficiently over long periods of time uh, with uh, uh, key scans. So that gives us a very powerful tool for building a wide variety of cybersecurity use cases and actually you know, doing things like periodicity analysis on streams as well. Um, the way that we actually build these, and um, I think we've got time to look at some of this, is we've also incorporated uh, another innovation in this, which is the Stellar language. And uh, yeah, what we call, we call Stellar, or at least I certainly call Stellar, Excel for cybersecurity, Excel functions for cybersecurity. 
a way in which this language works is it's very much based on the principle of extreme simplicity. That's the Excel bit. If you can use Excel, you can use Stellar. It's very expression-based, so it's very deliberately uh, a very lightweight language designed to work on a single field of this stream and to manipulate those pieces of stream. So we can use that for transformations of this data, but we can also use it for driving some of these more advanced analytics. So if you look at things like uh, the function composition capability, it provides the power to put together quite complex. You can even do a full map reducing it, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, but the other, the other side that you see here is uh, you have a way in which these profiles build up. You can see things like uh, you know, the iterative side of the uh, profiles and how a simple statement in Stellar can start to build up some quite complex uh, profile analysis, quite complex stats, as well as, again, this very trivial example of bringing back you know, through the Stellar stats library a full baseline from that profile, for example. So this gives us, um, yeah, this gives us a, a very, uh, yeah, very flexible means of building out, again, a lot of those use cases uh, and operating them real time in the stream as well. Uh, we also have Stellar functions which will, say, pull out and pass data to uh, a, our model as a service component, which hosts full machine learning models. So the goal here is very much to provide something which is incredibly simple to do your first pass on that huge amount of data. Uh, and then take that and, uh, you know, so do, do the kind of first pass on the million, 1.2 million we did on that six node cluster, uh, events per second. Process that through as a rough pass with these approximate data structures, and then spend your compute money, spend your expensive uh, you know, GPU boxes on the things that actually matter coming out of the end of that as well. So rather than the uh, you know, approach which some vendors take, which is to say, well, we have an extremely fancy neural network which does all this. It's like, great, you have an extremely fancy neural network, and I can run millions of events per second through it. If I have a quarter of a million to spend on, a, you know, on a, each node, of yeah, NVIDIA DX1 or something like that. So with that, I hope that's given you a bit of an introduction to what we're doing. Uh, apologies it was so brief. Uh, you can find out more from the Apache site there um, or from uh, you know, your, your friendly local Horton workers. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please do feel free to get in touch with me on Twitter or in fact, uh, I'll be around uh, here for a little while now, but uh, thank you very much. Has anyone have any questions? Someone, whoever gets the mic first. Okay, yes, my question is that you mentioned the whole diverse um, applications and tools that um, are hitting the customers. And um, I, I'm returning the question to you because uh, all your security system I see is based uh, on Hadoop. And I'm realizing that in each part of a, of a customer, there is a need of Hadoop for security, there is a need of Hadoop for the business, there is a need of Hadoop for the marketing. Uh, so how, how, how do you see that? Do, should we have a whole, uh, only single system Hadoop? <laughs> and and, and uh, with yeah. in, improved technologies, other other tools with uh, massive uh, processing will be added to the to the stack. So some vendors will tell you that you need a different Hadoop cluster for everything, uh, because they do say tools which manage multiple Hadoop clusters. <laughs> Um, what, uh, what I would tend to say is that you know, the whole point and purpose of a lot of the big data tech was to try and remove silos of architecture. Uh, one of the things we have found with the security you know, use case in particular is you know, some security departments are very, very antsy about keeping their data in anything that they can't actually see because they're naturally paranoid people. Uh, so they do, you have know, a security use cases, people do tend to kind of like having their own cluster. That said, uh, some of the more interesting and visionary people are actually looking to use uh, the security tech along with the rest of their big data infrastructure and with insight from the rest of their big data infrastructure to augment that. So part of the reason why I was talking about bringing in uh, non-traditional security sources, things like the business sources, things like uh, you know, customer transaction data from a website, for example, 
uh, is extremely useful as a security indicator as much as it is as a marketing tool or as a um, yeah whatever you know, whatever you use uh, customer transactions for delivery of product occasionally I, I understand but yeah for yeah so those kind of BI analytics data sets are also just uh, you know can also provide relevance to the security use case so yeah absolutely if you can get the security people to agree keep them all in the same place and that's just fine. Um, that said, for some people, that architecture doesn't work for whatever reason, for compliance reasons, for privacy reasons. Uh, yeah, everyone's very excited about uh, isolation of data sets in light of trying to prepare what on earth they do about GDPR right now. Uh, but yeah, but there's no reason for this to just keep, to keep adding new clusters for everything. Um, yeah, you can reuse the tech and also use the best tech for the problem, right? I think there was one other question, if, we um, have, if it's quick. If it's quick, sure. So I see you using Storm, uh, but a few years ago, Twitter basically killed it. I just wanted to hear a bit more about why you use Storm. Is okay. So the, the perennial question of why are you still using Tor Storm when Twitter killed it? First off, Twitter, Twitter killed a version of Storm that they hadn't updated. Twitter had their own private fork of it, which was about two years behind real Storm. So Twitter didn't kill Storm. They killed their private internal fork of Storm that was still stuck, sucked as much as it did when they first pushed it out of the community. Uh, since then, there's been a lot of development on Storm. Um, to be honest, the actual underlying tech doesn't matter nearly as much as the use case of the architecture in general. You could equally you know, use something like Spark to build this, but you take more latency, for example. Part of the reason for, that we're using Storm in particular is because the use case focuses on very, very low latency, uh, and Storm is actually reasonably well supported. There are, it, it is still, uh, I mean, the reason Twitter killed it was a pain in the ass to debug, right? Uh, a lot of progress has uh, come out of the Storm community around making it more debuggable, making it more transparent uh, in the last few years. So that's eased a lot of our pain around that. Things like um, you know, strong Kerberos support were also a, a minor factor in that. Uh, but really, the reason we're using it is for that very, very low latency use case because we have that you know, kind of specialist requirement of individual message processing at very, very low latency. Okay. Also, we have a whole bunch of storm committers sitting at the next desk so we can make them fix stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you a lot, Simon. Thank you very much.